welcome to another episode of Wakile Quick One. Omsia za kuwa hapa kwa issue ina why let's introduce show. Welcome to the Quick One Wakile show. Uh, thanks for your patience for waiting for me. Uh, today we have a very seasoned lawyer. Uh, we almost having run a business almost uh, quarter a decade. Uh, I will invite him to introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Arthur Igeria. As a gentleman has said, I am a lawyer by profession and I have been in uh, private practice for about 25 years now and still going. Mm. Hey. Mm. <laughs> Sasa, let's do this. Yes. Nataka tuanzei safari mani vianza. Where it all began? From uh, your formative years? Mm without skipping much yeah. but also without being uh, so mm. uh, so broad towards the safari we end up primary school wapi where did you grow up where did you go to primary school let's capture that journey okay so i i started i went to primary school here in nairobi and uh, it's interesting because when i was young just when I was starting primary school, they were introducing the the rule that you'd have to be six years when you start primary school. But there were some schools that were not very strict about it. And my father wanted me to start school when I was five. So the only school that relaxed that rule was a school called the Lovington Primary School. So that's where I started. And uh, interestingly, we lived in Eastlands, oh. and I used to take the bus yeah. from Eastlands to Lovington at class two, class three, sometimes alone. I don't call that. <laughs> yeah. I used to start you, okay? Yes. Because um, I, I want people to know that there's a time system used to work. Yes. So how did that journey flow for the bus? How did it happen? It, so, I would, uh, we lived in a place called Kimathi Estate. Mm -hmm. So, I would cross the road, hop into a bus number 22 or 23, which would then drop me off at Kencom. And then from Kencom, I would take bus number 6 mm -hmm. to Lovington. I see. <laughs> and in the evening, vice versa, mm -hmm. I'll take number 6 into town. Then uh, the big, the major bus stop was at Ambassador Hotel. Wow. So at Ambassador, I would hop off and then climb onto bus number 22 or 23, straight to Eastlands, and I'm back home. Mm. With yeah. siblings or alone? Uh, alone. My siblings were younger. I'm the eldest in my family, so they hadn't started school then. I see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so systems worked yeah. then. Uh, we, we would have one shilling or whatever it was that was a pass for you. Yeah. And you paid and you got your ticket and you did the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so I started off in Lovington. Then um, when I was in class four, our family moved to the Parklands area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I joined a school called Hospital Hill from class four to class seven. And uh, from there I went to high school which uh, where, where, was where? Nairobi school. I was in Nairobi school Patch, for four Patch. years. Yes, yeah. Patch. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did my A-levels in a school called Jamhuri. Jamhuri ah, High School. Jamhuri. Yeah. Jamhuri. Yeah. Jamhuri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the last episode, uh. I had a guy who went to Changes. Yes. And of course, you know the rivalry between you guys, uh, between Changes, changes and, and Patch. Patch. Yeah. And for the longest time in this show, we've always had guys for Alliance. Yeah. Yes. So... Of course, you have to speak about uh, the transition at, uh, at at Patch. Yes. So when you get to Patch, yeah. are you playing an instrument? Are you playing a sport? What besides school? What are you doing? Okay. So, uh, uh, in fact, I I I'd li I am happy f to have this opportunity to to speak about Patch yes. because um, I believe I and many of the people who went to Patch uh, owe who they are today. Uh, because of the from the culture that was in that school uh, yes as you said there was rivalry between uh, changes and patch 
uh, and but there was a bit of a difference I, in the sense that Patch was a slightly bigger school and uh, it accommodated students from a wider range of um, of the Kenyan society yeah. uh, unlike Lenana but the cultures were very similar yeah. and, and, and and that's why there was that rivalry because of that similarity there there was a need to to distinguish ourselves so the rivalry was was mostly in the sporting arena, yeah. um, but our, the similarities were in, in the cultures in the sense that in first term you did certain games, second term there was a different game, third term different games, yeah. and you must all were all required to participate mm. in the games uh, that that were prominent in the different terms. Why that was good is because it, it allowed people to excel in whatever their strengths were. So if you did hockey and you were good in hockey, then during the term when hockey was, it was hockey season, yeah. you excelled. If yeah. it was during the term when it was rugby season, then you excelled if you were a good rugby player. Yeah. So uh, if you were a good cross-country runner, then you excelled during mm -hmm. the term of cross-country. Mm -hmm. And so everybody got an opportunity to, 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 to excel and to demonstrate their skills in, in whichever way that uh, they were endowed mm. and whichever whatever their strengths were uh, and, and so that is what uh, I liked about Nairobi school that it gave everybody uh, an equal chance at life irrespective of what your background was and that was um, the critical thing the the culture in Nairobi school was that you you distinguished yourself on the basis of your individuality it didn't matter what your background was whether you are rich or poor, whether you are from um, the village mm. or from the city, what matters is how well you are able to excel mm. at an individual level. So you worked hard and hard work was emphasized and recognized. So much so that uh, if you distinguished yourself and you had a blazer, you, we all had blazers, yeah. you got uh, uh, something called a color, which was sword was sewed onto your blazer mm -hmm. so if it was rugby for instance yeah. you'd have a, a, a color written rugby yeah. something sewed on rugby soccer yeah. um, hockey swimming and um, if you had a number of them so you wore that blazer with pride yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and it did and that blazer mm -hmm. which you wore with pride distinguished you as an individual it didn't really matter what school you had been to, what part of the city you lived in, uh, what part of the country you came from, as long as you had that blazer yeah. and it demonstrated your abilities, then you earned respect. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that uh, what prepared us for life. Yeah. As you came into life, you realize uh, that your hard work is what distinguishes you mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in your profession. When you hold yourself out as a lawyer and a client walks in, mm -hmm. Uh, you may have given them a resume that shows where you went to school, what your background is, but ultimately what matters is how well you're able to serve that client. And that is what will determine whether the relationship with the client will be uh, continuous or not. Yes. Yeah. Um, now the transition from Nairobi school to Jamhuri. Yes. Uh, maybe for some of us, I'm sure you didn't go through levels. Or was it O and A? Well, we yeah we, we we did O and A levels, okay, and um, the 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 system then mm. was that after you did fourth form, yeah, you then made a choice between uh, arts and sciences, and that determined what your course would be uh, in university. Okay, so if you did sciences, then you'd end up um, uh, either uh, doing medicine or uh, engineering or dentistry mm -hmm. or any of those science-based uh, yeah. university degrees and if you did the arts then you, you could be anything from a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, um, commerce, uh, accountant, etc. Yeah. So, so the filtering was done at that level mm -hmm. where you started specializing in, in your A-levels mm -hmm. uh, with a view to determining where you wanted to be in university mm -hmm. and that was the system that uh, Th that we went through. So, in your first four years of high school, uh, you did everything, 
and then at, at fourth form, when you got your results, it will, you then were able to determine where your strengths and, and weaknesses lied. And, um, and then you, you made a choice at that point as to whether you're going to be an artist or a scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, just a follow-up question. Yeah. In your opinion, uh, do you think that was a, a good point to make that decision? A good point in your education? It's debatable. Uh, I think that system had its uh, benefits mm. because it allowed you to be focused on exactly what it is that you determined were your strengths. Mm. And I say that because uh, there are lots of people who unfortunately were pushed into areas where they, they didn't have the strengths. So, uh, and for various reasons, I mean, like when we were growing up, a lot of people felt that it, it, it was more manly to be in the sciences. Yeah. So you ended up with people, uh, and A-level was a completely different field mm. from the O-level. Mm. So you, you got into very technical sciences that a lot of people were not able to handle. And they, they realized too late that their strengths were in the arts. Yeah. Yeah. Then you end up with a poor A-level grade and the door to university is locked. Mm -hmm. Okay, And at that point, it's too late to, to backtrack yeah. and take another thing. So people's careers, some people's careers were ruined at that point. Uh, unfortunately, also, there wasn't very strong mentorship to, to guide one. Uh, the, the guidance for many people was their parents and said this is what we want you to do mm -hmm. and this is what the family has determined yeah. for whatever reason if maybe you came from a line of doctors uh, your uh, your future was determined at that point whether or not you had strengths in sciences so so it had that weakness but it had the strength of allowing you to determine from an early uh, stage mm -hmm. what you were inclined to be in and what you were going to be good at so if you knew without a doubt that you wanted to be a doctor, you worked hard at the subjects that would take you in that direction. If you knew you wanted to be an, uh, uh, a lawyer, likewise, yeah. you worked hard in those subjects and, and you made sure that you got a grade that would take you into the faculty uh, of law. Mm -hmm. so, so, for, so for many of us who uh, maybe inadvertently yeah. realized that <laughs> the sciences were not our strengths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And maths in particular, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you very quickly then focused on on the art subjects yeah. that ensure that you got into the faculty of, of law mm -hmm. or or the faculty that was your choice in terms of the arts. That's an evolution. Yeah. I'll yeah. ask you this because we also grew up in a generation where yeah. our folks used to tell us yeah. maybe you were number one kill us here. Yeah. Yeah. Were you that kind of a student? And also that you can join this question with yeah. At what point do you realize that um, now I want to go and do that? Yeah. At first, Jibulas was the younger brother. Yeah. Are you, were you that kind of a student who was always number one in class? Uh, I would say yes and no. Yes and no because. <laughs> <laughs> yes, depending well, on who is asking. <laughs> no, 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 not really. Yeah. Yes, depending mm. on, on how you exerted yourself. Yeah. Okay? Mm. Uh, many of us, uh, we. we we had it. We had the potential to top the class, but we never really uh, ex uh, fully exerted, ex yourself. Ex exerted yeah. ourselves yeah. Uh, to, to that level. Mm -hmm. But a very interesting thing happened to me when I was uh, doing my A-levels. Mm -hmm. I had moved from uh, a boarding school to a day school. And uh, my A-levels I uh, were characterized by a feeling that uh, this was make or break for me. Yeah. And um, I used to walk to school from home. And I would walk past a construction site. Mm. Uh, in the area of Parklands, they were building an Indian temple and it was very labor intensive. So as I walked by, I would see the casual laborers waiting to come into work. And of course, I wouldn't always walk by at the same time. So on some days, when I walked by, they were all standing by the gate waiting uh, for, their, for them to be picked for the day's job. 
On other days, when I walked by, the, the gates had opened and they were running in for their day's job. On other days, I would pass by and find that the gate has closed. Mm -hmm. And I would see the faces of dejection of those who hadn't gotten the job for the day. But one thing I was sure mm. of at that point is that if I didn't pass my A-levels, I would be one of those guys. Mm. And the reality stared me in the face so clearly that it forced me to work very hard to, to ensure that I didn't get yeah. into that space. Mm. So, uh, so that I worked so hard that at the end of my A-levels, I ended up being the best student. That's why I say, was I, the answer is yes and no. no yeah, I see. I see. <laughs> but but the, I think when I was doing my A-levels, the motivation to excel was, was not that I could be called on as a first mm. student, was that I would avoid mm. that reality. Yeah. That I would be, my, my days would be characterized by what the day provides for me at that yeah. point mm -hmm. and a very small window would determine whether I would have a successful day or not yeah and, and that is what uh, motivated me to to work very hard in my A-levels yeah. yeah so I ended up at the end of the university so you end up at the university probably. yeah um, are that saying is the campus in campus or is it in Parkland's no, no, we, uh, interestingly, we did our first two years of university yeah. at uh, main campus. Main campus. Uh, and of course, uh, before we joined the university, we had to do the mandatory three months at the National Youth Service. We were in that uh, group. Tell us that. <laughs> tell us that. We've never had it before. <laughs> so, uh, I think the government of the day then was, was looking for a solution to dealing with um, university strikes st or strikes by university students. Yeah. And um, an idea was then floated that uh, these university students required, would, would benefit mm. from a process where the, the discipline was instilled. Mm. And the National Youth Service was then identified yeah. as, a, as a place where pre-university students yeah. would go to, and it was mandatory. Mm -hmm. So we, we went to the National Youth Service for three months uh, as, a, as a condition to joining university. So if you didn't go to the NYS, mm. you forfeited your university place unless you are exempted on health grounds. Uh, now you can imagine for us at that point, uh, we were determined not to be exempted on health grounds. Yeah. Yeah, because we wanted to be sure that we were. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But what we didn't know was uh, the horrors that were awaited us mm. uh, uh, in the three months. But it also gave us an interesting insight into, into the reason why people who, who are in the uniformed forces behave the way they do. And it's because when you go through training, the one thing that you're trained to do is to respect authority. Uh, and, and in NYS, they used to tell us uh, that um, there was a phrase that was often used, mm. which is that Amri ni kubwa kuliko yule ambaye aliyeitoa. This kind of means yeah. doesn't matter who's giving you the instruction. Yeah. As long as there's an instruction, it must be complied with yeah. to the letter. Yeah. Yeah. But basically what that uh, instills in you is, uh, is the respect for authority, mm. which is critical. Yeah. Uh, because authority is, it comes in different levels. For us now as practitioners, the authority is a client. You, you, you get to, you must understand what the client wants and you, to a great extent, comply with it uh, as long as you are within the, the law. But at the same time, you also understand that you're a professional. And so there is a, there's a delicate balance which you have to meet um, uh, as, as, you, as you juggle with dealing with the authority. Yeah. So NYS was interesting. It stretched us physically. And uh, it allowed us to understand that uh, it's not just the big f people physically who, who manage mm. in situations. Yeah. Uh, and, and it also allowed us to understand that we can manage anything. You know, there were days when we were sure that we wouldn't be 
alive or healthy the following day. Mm -hmm. And then you remember that thought much later in the following day. Like, oh, I was supposed to have been very sick today because I spent two hours marching in the rain, mm -hmm. trying to perfect uh, a marching exercise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> two hours. You know, you know um, I mean, life as an um, outside, yeah. we, we, we are always working towards creating comfort. When it rains, you pull out an umbrella. When it's cold, you get a jacket. But we, in, N in NYS, we were often in situations where we had none of those comforts and we expected that yeah. our bodies would cave in. Yeah. But co they to the not. contrary, no, they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are stronger yeah. than we actually believe we are. Yeah. We just need to mm. harness that thought mm. and, and use it mm. to move us to the next level. Because many times we shy away from challenges because we believe that we do not have the strength. But in reality, we do actually have the strength. We have the, the ability uh, to, to manage uh, the, the challenges that face us. Yeah. And NYS taught us that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me at a personal level, I think what it, what it taught me was that I have a choice to determine how to manage a situation of challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, these people may, the, the external forces may throw whatever it is that they throw at me. But ultimately, the choice of how I manage that challenge lies within me. Yeah. So um, when I was in NYS, I made a deliberate choice to look at everything positively yeah. and to take the positive lessons that NYS threw at me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I managed to, yeah. to survive mm -hmm. the, the horrors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So later on, we'll ask, uh, I'll ask you a question. Having yeah. run a farm for 25 years, yeah. I'll ask you about the impact of the, the school system, yeah. the education system, mm -hmm. and also the generations over time, yeah. uh, how they impact on employment, since you've also been employing people in various generations. Yeah. Uh, but maybe perhaps we can now finish the school system, the education yeah. system. You went to to law school and then after that you went to Kenya School of Law. Yeah. What's, what was the transition like, the timelines and what were your experiences in KSA? Okay, let me, let me rewind a bit. Eh? Yeah. Uh, when I went to boarding school, it was very regimental. Wait, boarding school? It, boarding school, school part. Yes, part, oh. yeah. It was very regimental mm. uh, and um, ev every activity was time-based. So a bell woke you up. Yeah at maybe 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. And you knew that at that point, there were certain things you need to do because you had to be at breakfast by a particular time. So you woke up, you made your bed, you tidied your surroundings, yeah. and you were punished if you were untidy and if your clothes were dirty. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and we had inspection uh, two, twice a week mm -hmm. just to ensure that you, your clothes were clean yeah. and well ironed and you were presentable. Uh, of course, we, 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 we despised it at that point. Yeah. But those who are in authority over us ensure that we comply. Now, later on in life, um, you realize the benefit of, of that, yeah. that, the inculcation of those disciplines. Because um, if, if I know that I have a week that will, where I'm required to be up by a particular time, I'll do it. Yeah. And it's, it's possible. So that system... Uh, prepared me for later on in life where uh, when I'm faced with those challenges where life has to be structured in a particular way I'm not resistant to it because yeah. I've lived it mm. yeah so having gone through uh, an education system uh, and, and, and a culture where I, I had to do things at a particular time in a particular way and there was no option yeah yeah I realized that sometimes in life you're presented with situations where there's no option but you do it. Yeah. You, you face that challenge mm. because you don't have an option. Yeah. But you deal with the challenge that way uh, without looking for, for, for options. Ways around it. It, yeah. Anyway, so g going through high school uh, prepared me for the, what, what the university presented, wh which was a fairly relaxed free life. Mm. But at the end of the day, there was the expectation that if you didn't manage your time well then you could lose your place in the university mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we, we had lessons at different times of the day uh, during the week. And we had free, free times. So how you used your free time then determined mm. whether you got a good grade or not. You're going to buy a campus. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. There was a place called the Student Center. <laughs> Tasca, you go how much? Yeah. How much it was Tasca, cheap. How much? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and there were lots of options. Yeah. We had the Student Center, yeah. uh, which was in the university. Yeah. Okay. But apart from the Student Center, yeah. there were also various uh, places mm. around uh, the city yeah. that people patronized. Um, and and uh, I remember there was a club called Visions on Kimathi Street. Mm. Yes. Mm. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but they had a place called Visions. Yeah. And they had ladies night on uh, particular nights yeah. Yeah. where uh, girls would have come in at uh, either free or half. Right? There was a place called Ainsworth on Museum Hill, which was also Ainsworth, Ainsworth. which is also very right. famous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 With uh, lots of happy memories. Yeah. There was a uh, carnival which has outlived yeah. all those places, yeah. 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 Mm. And um, as university students, because we got an allowance, which we called Boom, we had money. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we, could pa we patronized all these places, yeah. um, and, and we lived our lives happily because <laughs> we, there was that element of, of being carefree. But at the same time, yeah. at the back of your mind, you knew that you needed to be responsible enough mm. to attend your classes, yeah. uh, do your exams, and pass. Because you are headed, you are looking at graduation, yeah. uh, and uh, you are looking at graduating from there, uh, in order to join your profession. So yeah. against all those odds, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you graduate. Mm -hmm. Where is Kenya School of Business? So now, when we graduated, yeah. uh, we then moved to a different level where you are now uh, a kind of a lawyer. Yeah, you are a pupil. But as a pupil, you are, uh, you are attached to a law firm and um, you have to wear a suit and tie. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as you do your pupillage, you also join the Kenya School of Law, which was uh, at the time situated on Valley Road. Valley, huh? Just exp expound that because yes. what, what, what we are used to yes. is, is first of all you go to Kenya School of Law, yes. then you come and do pupillage. Okay. Is, was that so we had a whole, no, we had a whole year. Yeah. Uh, and and during that year, you yeah. did pupillage and attended class at the Kenya School of Law. So it was broken down in between. But everything was combined so that even when um, you didn't have full class attendance, yeah. you, you were then expected to be in, in the office. Uh, okay. Uh, but there was a period yeah. during that one year yeah. when you had classes and exams. Yeah. So you are away from the office. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so what we would do, uh, because we, uh, we were a resident at the Kenya School of Law, mm -hmm. we would get into a bus, the Kenya School of Law bus, mm -hmm. and uh, the bus would now bring all of us into town. So okay. So from, from, no, no, yeah, here uh, at the, the, the dental school, I see. opposite uh, the Valley Road Church. Yeah, yes. yeah. So the bus would, would go down through Hill Selassie, mm -hmm. okay, through Nairobi area traffic, yeah. if you come down Hill Selassie, approach town from, uh, from Harambe Avenue, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Then it would drop people along Moy Avenue all the way and then exit through uh, GPO. Yeah. So wherever your office was, you got yeah. off yeah. at some point. <laughs> and then, uh, interestingly, at lunchtime, mm -hmm. the bus would come, mm -hmm. pick us, take us to school for lunch, mm -hmm. And, and then bring, bring you us back. back. Are you guys <laughs> <laughs> and then in the evening, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. same way. Yeah, yeah. Well, well the, the population wasn't that high then. Yeah, yeah. Traffic, was, mm. traffic jams were not that crazy as yeah. they are today. Yeah. So we lived well. Mm. And uh, of course, we, as, as I said, we were required to wear suits so, and tie. Mm. So we looked very distinguished <laughs> in, in, in that bus. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and that's how we did our pupillage mm. and uh, KSL yeah. Uh, yeah. exams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, of course, then uh, there was a paper on accounting that horrified all of us. And, and um, we all worked hard to ensure that we passed that paper. Mm. Uh, it wasn't um, uncommon to have to reset it yeah. once or twice. Yeah. Uh, and, and that happened. But we took it in stride and, and moved on.
Mm. Yeah. What in this in this instance, when yeah. you bring a PPH, which yeah. firm are you attached to? So initially, I started off uh, with a firm called Vora and Getao. Vo Vora. 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 Uh, yeah. Now, Vo Vora yeah. uh, was a, a seasoned older lawyer mm -hmm. um, from the Sikh community. Uh, yeah. And um, he partnered with a gentleman called Lawrence Getao. Yeah. And together they formed the firm of Vora and Getao, yeah. which was renowned then. Mm -hmm. Uh, as, w as a leading personal injury claims law firm. So that's where I did my pupillage. Mm. Uh, and, and then when I finished, uh, I, I got a job there. S started off my legal career in that firm. Yeah. And then I joined a firm called Warohi and Moite. Warohi and Moite Advocates. Moite. Yes, Paul Moite. Paul Moite, yeah. Yeah, Paul Moite and George Warohi yeah. and uh, several other partners they had. Yeah. And I worked there for some time. Yeah. And uh, after that, I then joined uh, the firm of Dungu, Jiroge, and Kwach. Mm. Dungu, Dungu and Kwach. So, uh, like I said, I started off with Voran Getau and um, then I went to Arohi and Muite Advocates mm. and eventually ended up at Dungu, Jiroge, and Kwach mm. before I, I set up my practice. Uh, and now life is very interesting because uh, the property we are sitting on now yeah. Yeah. was owned by Vora. Oh. Uh. In fact, this property next door was actually his residential house. I see. <laughs> 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 uh. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, that that has given us uh, a fairly cordial relationship yeah. with our current landlords yeah. when I told them that because uh, his daughter is our landlord mm -hmm. in this office mm -hmm. okay. so uh, we we have uh, a the connection ground, yeah. uh, because I knew her father yeah. and uh, they had very fond memories of their father yeah. so that in itself yeah. has has uh, broken a lot of ice yeah and I, I think the lesson there is that uh, you no know, in in which whoever it is you interact with yeah endeavor to have good interaction because you never know where in future paths will cross yeah either with that person or persons associated with with that person yeah yeah and 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 i'm happy to say that the interaction i had with fora mm -hmm. was a positive one and as a result of that now i'm reaping that benefit yeah because i have a a, a good relationship with my current Landlord, we when we sit down to negotiate the terms of our lease. Yes. Initially, I set it up, I set up uh, the practice on my own, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at the time when I was setting up, it was, it was a trend. You worked for some time, you got some experience, and then you you went out on your own, and everybody was doing it. So. The, the, the attitude then towards partnerships was very negative. Uh, things have changed over time. But at that point when we were setting up, which was um, in, in, uh, you know, to, towards the end of the 90s, the, the only successful partnerships were the very large ones. Mm -hmm. the, unfortunately, the the, the, I wouldn't call them Muzungus because <laughs> there were quite a number of Africans yeah. also in those farms. Mm -hmm. But the the senior members of the legal profession had not created a very good impression of successful partnerships yeah. so we were fearful of of getting into partnerships because many of them ended up in court people fought uh, and 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 you would see very vicious fights within uh, law firms that had partnerships and they were disintegrating so many of us started off on our own yeah. And, and that's how I started. Uh, the firm was then known as the Company, uh, situated at uh, Hughes Building, mm -hmm. uh, two, two small offices, yeah. and uh, launched from there. Mm -hmm. and, and we moved on. All right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your initial experiences running a business. Yes. Uh, having worked in three farms before, yeah. and now getting into private practice. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming at the time the, there were not too many sharks in the water. Yes, uh, but uh, how was it? How was it sourcing business? Um, 
getting clients. It was difficult, uh, and and you quick uh, quickly learned two or three lessons eh? that it's very important to be on good terms with everyone, including your colleagues. Yeah. You know, many times we think that our colleagues are our competitors and therefore our enemies, but uh, I had a lot of support from colleagues, uh, especially those who had more work than they could handle. They were more than happy to, to have me do their work for them as a, 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 a private uh, consultant, in a sense. Eh? So I had a lot of support from, uh, from colleagues, and the lesson learned from there is that uh, your colleagues, even though they may be your competitors, are not necessarily your enemies, and they can be of support to you in various ways. I mean, how many times as lawyers do we receive referrals from other lawyers? Yeah. Yeah. So, so one must not always, mustn't always look at their colleagues as enemies, yeah. as uh, people who are going to fight to get clients from, or to be very careful with my interaction with, at least they steal their, my clients yeah. from me. So that's one lesson I learned about practice. Another was how to juggle between being a professional and being an entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, you've got bills to pay. Yeah. yeah? Uh, and, and, but you see, many of us were driven into private practice because when you're in employment, uh, you're under the policies of your employer. So if your employer does not believe in taking on certain cases, then your, your, your hands are tied. You may want to help someone who yeah. has a particular case. Yeah. You may w even want to say, for instance, join a demonstration in support of a particular cause. But your employer says, no, 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 yeah. that's, not, that's not where we are at. Yeah. So we, many of us launch into private practice to, to exercise the freedom of choice in who to represent. So you can jump into that, that, that uh, pool, so to speak. But at the end of the day, you quickly realize that you've got bills to pay. And people take advantage of you when you don't have your eye on that. Yeah. So there are a couple of months when you realize you've done a lot of work, but you haven't built properly for it. Yes. Okay, so, so those are some of the lessons you learn. Yeah. How, how to, to value your time. That your time is of value. And you have to value it in a particular way so that your clients recognize and pay for that work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, j just a follow-up question. Mm. I, I'm turning three in my farm now. Yes. We, we just set up three years ago and you're turning three in July. Yeah. And there's a very important point you've talked about. Of course, when you're leaving employment, uh, you're used to having briefs placed on your table. And uh, your idea of competence is doing as much as you can, as quickly as you can. But then you go out there and now you have to have that mind shift of actually being the person who goes out to hunt and then bring the deer home. At which point in your first few years did you feel that transition getting into place? Yeah, f from day one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. From, from day one, yeah. you, you, you created an office and um, you must have money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, even just to buy uh, the equipment you have in that office. Yeah. Coffee yeah. especially. Yeah. <laughs> Coffee especially. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so where, you gonna, where, where are you going to get that money yeah. from? Yeah. You have to look uh, for, for it from your briefs. Yeah. From, from the work you do. Uh, and, and how do you get clients uh, unless you, you get them from existing lawyers? And I did a lot of briefs for lawyers, and, 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 and I'm very thankful to them yeah. uh, that, that supported me in, in those initial days. Yeah. Uh, and, and they paid, they paid me yeah. <laughs> for the work I did. Yeah. And uh, slowly, some of the people who I acted for on behalf of those lawyers became my clients yeah. without uh, any acrimony or conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not to say they were looking for, for, for people to offload. But to answer your question, uh, that realization comes to you immediately. Mm. Because if, and if it doesn't, it will be a shock. Because at the end of the month, yeah. you have your rent to pay. Or at the end of the quarter, you have your rent to pay. Mm. Uh, depending on where you are, you may have utilities to pay. Mm. Uh, of course, you also have your own personal expenses which don't stop. Uh, 
because yeah, you're now in a different business, frame yeah, um, of, of, of uh, employment. So you have to have your, your eye on that mm. as you work. So it's, it's an immediate concern that must be addressed immediately. Yeah. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So, mm. Um, first of all, yeah. uh, just congratulations. You guys are turning 25 years. Yeah. That is Thank you. As, uh, some, some of, of you have been alive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, mm. just to pick on, on something that you've talked about, you've talked about um, having partners. Yeah. And uh, at this time, when you're, the time you started your practice, you have you seen a bad experience from the guys who are there setting up our partnerships. And now, here you are, 25 years later, you have partners. What has been your experience and what has made you to be, to be still standing today and bringing in good partners? And still walking the journey. What are some of the things that you're looking for in a partner, and how do how do this make partnership last? What what is the sticking glue? Okay, so first of all, let me say that uh, there is no correct answer to anything. It all depends on what you want. So it, so that there's nothing wrong with being a sole practitioner, if that's what you've decided you want for your life then by all means go for it yeah. uh, and nobody should vilify you for that decision also there's nothing wrong with having a partnership uh, and and there's nothing wrong with a partnership being a partnership of two or of 10 or 25 there's absolutely nothing wrong i think what is important is the decision one makes about how they want their life to be structured yeah. okay uh, and and you then bear reap the consequences yeah. of of that decision that you make mm -hmm. and the benefits. Mm -hmm. So for me, earlier on, I, I uh, when I started practice, I knew in my mind that uh, looking forward, uh, the way the picture looked, I wanted it to look as it does now, um, with a team and not alone. As much as being alone works for some people, yeah. I knew that that is not the picture I wanted to be in. Yeah. Mm. Okay? Yeah. And that is what has informed where I am today. Mm. Now, uh, with regards to what you say, how does one look for partners? Again, there's no cut and paste. There's no correct or wrong answer. Mm. Uh, and people have different views about what constitutes a good a working partnership uh, and, and what the do's and don'ts are. Yeah. And, uh, so I would say by and large you have to figure out what works for you. But uh, there has to be a commonality in very many aspects, in critical aspects okay, so that it works. Yeah. It would be foolhardy for me to think that if I'm the kind of person who is driven. I, I wake up at 5.30, yeah. I'm in the office by 6, I work until 8. That my ideal business partner would be someone who has <laughs> a completely different... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Be because you have to have a certain um, meeting of yeah. minds as far as values are concerned. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. For that partnership to be successful, uh, you you and, and, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with people who have different values. Mm -hmm. It's just that you, have, you must understand that if your values are not uh, aligned, um, aligned yeah. Yeah. at a particular... It, they, you know, there are certain things that must be aligned for the partnership to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that um, if you're both going hunting and you've agreed to meet a particular time, yeah. you have to be sure that your partner will be there will be there yeah. you cannot be in partnership with somebody who you you you're uncertain about in mm. in certain fundamental aspects yeah. it, let's say for instance uh, even on the element of integrity mm. you have to be sure that the your partner is not the guy who's going to be uh, arrested <laughs> 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 for having broken the law about certain so something mm. yeah or, or for protesting <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or maybe he received money from a client and yeah, didn't yeah, disclose yeah. it and to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Mm. And, and you find yourself mm. liable 
for that. You've got to be sure that the people who you're in partnership with are not inclined in that direction. Now, now, now uh, of course, it doesn't, um, and I'm not saying that your choice of partnership must be based on, on very, very specific things, but at least you must be certain that if someone came up to you and said, hey, listen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your partner has just uh, pocketed uh, X number of millions yeah. from some deal, mm. yeah, uh, you, can, you can confidently say, I am sure that that is not yeah. my partner. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not able to say that and you're in a partnership, mm. uh, then, you know, it's, it's almost akin to a marriage. Yeah. The person who you select yeah. as your spouse yeah. is a person who you're very sure is, is, is not going to do certain things. Yeah. Unless, uh, and, but you see, before you've even committed to the partnership, you you have already tested the relationship in certain respect. So you know, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you so can move the relationship to another level. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in this case, you must yeah. have worked with someone before you make them a partner. Of course, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you have to. Yeah. yeah, and you must you must have worked with them. Yeah. At at specific level, because you see, as as you come together as partners, you're bringing your strengths to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one one half strength in different areas and so you put your strengths together yeah. and then when you pitch to clients they see these strengths yeah. and they support your partnership yeah yeah all right mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about hiring yeah um you hired for 25 years i'm sure you hired someone the first year you started yeah and probably yeah. even hired someone last year yeah um what what have you seen as a shift in the in the various hiring cycles that you've had and uh, especially speaking to the to the generational aspect of the various lawyers who have worked for you yeah um and also the education system yeah yeah well le let me start off with um, again what do you see yourself uh, hiring yes and um, and i know that as i say this i speak for many people yeah you see when when um, you create a business yeah uh, you brand it in a particular way and you you arrogate certain values to your to your business and and uh, align those values to your brand okay so anybody who comes into your space understands uh, or must understand what your values are and now these values uh, vary from uh, from office to office and they it, they work for different people in different ways so uh, we've had a fair share of uh, turnover because of people who don't ascribe to our values yeah yeah mm -hmm. and, and 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 we accept that if we're not aligned that way then um, our interaction will be brief uh, we've had mm -hmm. people uh, who have come in and gone yeah, because they feel that the, the situation does not work for them yeah. in terms of their brand. But well, we will not compromise uh, our value system uh, in order to accommodate uh, people simply because uh, we, we, we are we are dealing with a different generation. Yeah. Uh, but we are like to the reality that uh, not only does this generation exist, but they are a big majority of our population uh, and even for me as a parent of people who are in that generation yeah. the conversation is constant yeah. uh, I have back and forth with my son and daughter about how to live and, and what to do in order to succeed in life yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are certain values and principles that that you, you can't run away from irrespective of the fact that you're in a different generation, mm. okay? Yeah. So that, for if just to give you an example, uh, punctuality will always be a, 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 a value that must be upheld, whether you like it or not, uh, because that's how systems run. And you might think that I can afford to, you can afford to be late uh, at a particular uh, time, but there will be a time when uh, that lateness will cost you yeah That's integrity true. honesty some of these things you can't run away from whether or not you're in different generation and these are the values that we espouse as a firm and we we make it very clear that they are non-negotiables mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so if we have a, an office meeting at a particular time, we expect everybody to be present. If uh, uh, we hold ourselves out as, as a law firm, people expect lawyers to be dressed well and to be dressed in a particular way. So we are not going to go out to a meeting with somebody who's not dressed in, in, in a way that we, <laughs> <laughs> we expect uh, our clients to yeah, see us. Yeah. But you see, may, maybe your clients are different. Yeah. Maybe your clients appreciate you in that particular way, but the people who we are marketing ourselves to yeah. want to see us in in a uh, uh, in a particular type of appearance. If they don't, then we are shooting ourselves in the foot uh, by by going to them in a particular way. So, so you know, we hold ourselves out at a particular as a particular brand, branded in a particular way. This is who we are. If you look at our profile, you will see us in a particular appearance and we, we, we tell our story as ourselves in a particular way. Those who buy into that yeah. support us mm -hmm. and they support our vision and mission and that's why we are where we are. So how do we deal with um, the, the, the generation, gen, gen C as you call them? Gen Z. <laughs> gen Z. Gen Z. We, we, we tell them who we are, we show them who we are, we, we try and sell our gospel to them. If they buy into it and they want to work with us, that's fine. If, if they feel that they can be more productive outside our space, then we allow them to um, uh, respectfully. But we know that life teaches these lessons at different levels in different ways. And, and we try and mentor them as best as we can. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, just a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm speaking for the Gen Zs because I've seen their interaction with the older lawyers. Yeah. Uh, there's one thing I see them struggling with, they question authority. And if you look at the continuum from people who had to like go to NYS yes, to, be yeah. taught, <laughs> to, to be taught to follow yeah. a leader and an instruction is an instruction, the current generation will question the instruction. Not from a perspective of wanting to disobey it, but from wanting to have a buy-in in it. So maybe this question is more from a lawyer's perspective as opposed to the firm because i do understand that firms do have missions and visions and ethos and they can draw a line if you cross then you're not going to be acceptable but increasingly in future how are you as a practitioner accommodating a person who who is more authoritative in communicating what they want who prioritizes Balance, I understand, I've, I've interacted with old, yeah. both the yeah. old and the young. Yeah. Uh, balance is not something the older generation are very keen on. The current generation is very keen on balance. Um, they're also very keen on working on their time and delivery being deliver, delivery of what it needs to be delivered being the KPI as opposed to a structure. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how do you see yourself um, interacting with that lawyer who is going to be amongst the only lawyers who will be available <laughs> at some point in future? That's a very interesting question. You see, over time, uh, those of us who've grown up in a very structured environment have gotten to realize that um, even when you're dealing with a client, you must listen and understand to the client and appreciate what it is that they want. Yeah. Okay. So that sometimes, uh, and, and you see for us as a firm, uh, what drives us, our tagline is being solution oriented. Okay, we provide solutions. Yeah. Now the solutions may, must, may not always be in the book or in the structured way, which is why that liberal thinking comes in mm -hmm. and is embraced. Yeah. Yeah. Because we want to provide a solution to our client. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we embrace uh, a liberal way of thinking, an out of the box type of thinking that is solution oriented. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at uh, at the same time you must also understand that even as you provide your client with a solution, yeah, you might you must provide a solution that's workable. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so to, to give you an example, there are certain structures that you can't run away from. 
whether you like it or not. Yeah. Okay. If you have, if you're dealing with a court matter, and the judge says this matter will be in court tomorrow at nine. Yeah. Yeah. You there's no excuse. Or there's no running away from the fact that you must avail yourself before that judicial officer at nine. At that time, yeah. Okay. And if you're if you're presenting a case, there are rules on how that case must be presented. If the judge says you must file your documents within a certain period of time, you must do it. That's true. Okay. And this is what the younger generation must understand, that even as they seek to change the world, yeah, <laughs> there are certain structures that exist that you must, <laughs> you must obey. Oh, yeah. Because you, you, there's, you can't go to court and tell the judge, but, oh, you know, I belong to a different generation, and we believe <laughs> <laughs> in working <laughs> in flexi time. I had, I had, so, to, I had yeah, to meditate before yeah, I came. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we resist this structure that <laughs> <laughs> imposes on us timelines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll do it when we want. It, yeah. it, but there are certain things about life that just don't work that way. Yeah. You see? So, and, and then you must understand that even as you, you embrace a different way of working, yeah you must comply with certain uh, requirements if you, you're going to deliver to your client. If your client wants you to present their case to a court and to be successful, you're not going to be successful if you antagonize the judge. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, true. If you, and, and if you don't adhere to the judge's orders, you'll be antagonizing them. But at the end of the day, who will suffer? Your client. Your client. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you must think about what solution are you providing for your client and are you providing your client with a solution uh, yeah. that, that meets that legal problem that has brought them to your office? Yeah. Mm. You see? Mm. Yeah. So, so, so uh, and at the end of the day, as a, as a practitioner, you want your clients to pay you. Your client isn't going to pay you if you've not provided them with a solution That's they, true. they want. That's true. Yeah? Mm. So, so you have to learn how to balance all these interests, whether or not you are said to be you assert yourself as a member of a particular generation. You, 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 and you could very well proudly belong to a particular generation yeah. to come to work uh, dressed as you please. But um, at the end of the day, are you meeting your client's need? And are, are you, is your client going to pay you yeah. uh, for whatever it's service that you're, you're charging for? Yeah. So mm. uh, we, we are quite fortunate that uh, the, the gentlemen seated here, they took to specialization quite a bit. Um, they've taken to specialization in the practice of law. Uh, he did it a bit earlier than uh, me, and uh, you did it earlier than all of us. You've gone into the field of arbitration. And um, may, maybe tell us why, what, what, what made you go towards that direction? And also you could tell us, um, in, in the same question, you could also look at uh, the Nairobi um, Center of Arbitration and talk about it. Okay. And you were the first year, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Th uh, so my journey into arbitration yeah. was um, informed by the levels of frustration that I felt in court as a practitioner, simply because <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time, as you probably yeah, know, yeah, yeah. to get things moving in court. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'm not in any way blaming the judiciary or anyone. It's just that it's a system that, uh, that takes a long, a long time. Yeah. Uh, in, there, there, is, there is very few cases that are completed in court. And if you want to complete a, a case quickly, then you, you must adopt an approach where perhaps you sit down with your colleague and find a way of a quick settlement on various issues. You have to agree yeah. uh, to knock off certain issues and sometimes even agree on how to settle the case in its entirety. Now, uh, this is what has brought practitioners into what is referred to as alternative dispute resolution, which is alternative from the courts. Yeah. And, and, and you're in a system where a lot of consensus building occurs. Uh, and so it is there, therefore you have then arbitration and the mediation, which has picked up and which is also an area of practice that I do uh, quite a bit. Now, uh, the beauty of arbitration, uh, and I'll speak about arbitration and mediation because they are very distinct. Uh, the beauty of arbitration is that it borrows from the 
the, the strict aspects of of litigation in court, mm -hmm. where you have timelines, you 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 bring your case. Uh, the beauty is that you can take your case to an expert in that field, in a, in in the field that is the subject matter of the dispute, and that expert will be able to determine it quickly, and and within a short period of time, and time is of essence, especially to people who yeah. are. Uh, are in business and, and they want a dispute uh, determined quickly. The other uh, benefit of arbitration is that you can be very focused on on timelines uh, from the time you start a case to its conclusion yeah. uh, and, and, and it's dedicated. So you're not dealing with uh, uh, someone who's dealing with very many cases mm -hmm. uh, and cannot spare time for yours as would happen in court. So that's the beauty. Now with regards to mediation, the greatest advantage in that regard is the preservation of relationships. So you're, you're, you're resolving a dispute by building consensus between the disputants. And at the end of it, if it's successful, they shake hands and the relationship is restored. Yeah. Yeah. So you moved away from, from a dispute, uh, acrimonious uh, space, uh, to consensus building, to restoration of relationship, and, and people can continue with the relationship, whether it's commercial, or family relationships. So there is that benefit. And, and, and um, remember I talked about being a solution provider, yeah. which is what you are really as a, yeah. as, as, as a practitioner yeah. in, in any field, yeah. whether it's in the law or, or if you're, whether you're an, an engineer or you're a doctor, you're providing a solution. And many times you've had doctors joke about how they gave a patient uh, a drug mm. that wasn't really a drug <laughs> because they complained of a pain yeah, yeah, that they imagined yeah. existed. They, but they provided a solution. Yeah. So as a solution provider, uh, alternative dispute resolution has, has played a big role in ensuring that uh, uh, disputants meet this, find the solution that they're looking for, which is why I end up in, uh, in uh, arbitration and mediation. And it's fulfilling because I, I see myself as adding value to people mm. in, in that space where um, you want to help people resolve their disputes. Mm. And which is actually what attracted me uh, to the profession, mm. to the legal profession. When I was young, I used to watch uh, a show that I admired and had lawyers. Mm. Uh, it was called Crown Court. Crown Court. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, know about it. You know, uh, suits. <laughs> it was uh, you you probably know about suits and, yeah, and some yeah. of these. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but Crown Court was uh, was 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 uh, based in the UK, the British. Uh, those days when Teddy was in uh, black and white, it was yeah. it all centered around a courtroom, and and you got to see how lawyers um, uh, practice their advocacy skills. Yeah. Okay. And and to be to be a good lawyer. You, you must not necessarily be aggressive, uh, banging on tables. You have, to be, uh, you, you have to find a way to bring out your client's case and to destroy your opponent's case without necessarily being aggressive and acrimonious. That's yeah. advocacy, yeah. Okay? Which, is, which is the mark, the mark of a good lawyer. If you watch some of the lo good lawyers we see uh, on TV, even the local lawyers, yeah. they're not shouting and screaming and banging on tables uh, but they present their cases in ways that <laughs> convinces the judicial <laughs> officer yeah. that, that they should decide in that their clients favor yeah. so so uh, alternative dispute resolution being arbitration mediation has has grown uh, because people want to resolve their disputes quickly and arbitration clauses are now integral parts of contracts uh, as, as a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, I therefore got involved in the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, which is a, a, a state corporation that was created to set up an arbitration, an international arbitration center in this region in order to encourage uh, investors to, to, to bring their disputes to this region. And, and that when they're, when they're investing in this uh, region, they know that should there be a dispute, there is an international arbitration center that will deal with their dispute yeah. quickly and in a predictable manner, uh, away from the influences of, of politics and state and all that. That's how the uh, NCIA was created. And I was um, 
privileged to have been a member of the board and chaired it. Uh, and, and that also gave me uh, an opportunity to practice corporate governance, which I'm also an advocate of. Yeah, uh, create a creation of uh, a board, the structures of, of uh, a board of directors, and, and to structure it in a way that you, you adhere to the principles of corporate governance mm -hmm. and ensure that there's a clear distinction between the board and the management of an organization. Mm -hmm. And you allow both organs to run uh, independently, mm -hmm. but for the benefit of the organization. Yeah. So that in itself um, uh, was a very good experience. I, I did my bit and I've handed over the reins to the current uh, chair who's also doing a very good job and um, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration has grown and and with its growth we see Kenya being put on the map uh, in international um, arbitration. Yeah. Sasa, yeah. Because you've elaborated on that quite, 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 quite well. Yeah. You know where I'm getting at on the scale. Yes. We've thought about the issue of our building center. Yeah. Why? What are your views on that? Uh, well, <coughs> you see that there, there, there is a motivation. Whoever wants to build an arbitration center for the LSK has a reason. They are motivated by some reason. Uh, I haven't been um, intimately involved in the issues uh, that give rise to the need for an arbitration center, except to say that uh, the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration is more focused on international arbitrations. I suppose, I suppose the Law Society Arbitration Center would be dealing more specifically with uh, domestic domestic. Mm. So to that extent, there may not be a, a conflict. A conflict. There may not be. Even though the NCIA deals with domestic um, arbitrations. But for a center to run and have confidence in its uh, use with, with the users, it has to demonstrate a level of uh, impartiality and independence. Mm -hmm. That if I take my dispute to that center, I'm not going to be subject to external forces. Yeah, and, yeah. and that uh, we can happily run with it. Now, I, d I do know that part of the conversation rel relating to the center uh, amongst lawyers that has, has created acrimony has been with, with regards to the use of funds. Do lawyers feel that their funds are being adequately uh, used or utilized in the creation of an arbitration center? Now, the opinions vary. And, and that, unfortunately, uh, is what has created acrimony within that conversation, whether or not we should build the center, where should it be located, what services should, be, should it provide, yeah. are those services adequately provided for by the NCIA or even the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Do we, is it something we need, is it a proper use of funds, mm. etc. The, the issues are all out there. At the end of the day, if a consensus is reached, for the benefit of the members of the uh, Law society, yeah. I would definitely be in support of of a position of mm. that nature, yeah. yeah, that benefits lawyers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my last question yeah. is: uh, there are people who feel, mm. young lawyers especially, that ADR and in particular arbitration is an an old gentleman's club. Yeah. So for the young lawyers who might wish to get into that area of practice, yeah what would you tell them to look out for and do as they start? Okay, maybe two or three things. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, I, I, I believe that one must never assume something. If you're going to make a decision about something, make it based on your experience, tried and tested. So those who say that arbitration is a preserve of old gentlemen, it's an old, old gentleman's club, let them try it out first before they make that decision. Uh, but also let them understand, they need to uh, and ask, them, uh, ask and answer the question, 
uh, are they locked out of arbitration because of their age? Because arbitration is not an age, uh, it's not determined by age. Yeah. It's determined by how competent you are in dealing with an arbitration. Yeah. Have you studied it? Do you understand it? And at the end of the day, like I said earlier, as a practitioner, are you able to provide your clients with a solution to their problem through arbitration? Mm. Okay. So if you're a practitioner and you have a client who has a commercial dispute and their, their contract requires them to go to arbitration, are you going to turn them away because you don't deal mm. with arbitration? No. And so you're therefore not the solution provider for your client. Yeah. But if you have made a decision that that is not the space you're going to be in, then your decision will be respected and your client will move on to someone else. Yeah. But the consequence of that decision is something that then you, you as a practitioner will have to embrace. However, I would encourage young practitioners to explore all these options, explore uh, life in practice in court, explore life in practice in arbitration and mediation, and then decide where you want to be. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. But, but don't make an assumption that because this is arbitration therefore this is what it provides and that's <laughs> it and therefore i'm going to stay away yeah, yeah. experience mm. it first and then make your decision based on your experience mm. and whether that experience has been good or bad for you mm. yeah so mm. <coughs> we are coming to the table uh -huh. Which was my last question. Yeah. And I, I'm actually going to switch the language so that you don't give me a lawyer answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope I haven't given you a lawyer answer. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. But no, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, you've done very well. Mm. Uh -huh. Sasa, yeah. um, you've walked into your office. Yeah. And uh, no, you have to stop at some time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've seen a number of cars, toy cars somewhere. Yeah. We've seen an aquarium. Yeah. We've seen a guitar here. See, that informs the kind of a person that you are. So, who's Arthur? What does Arthur do? Ile wakati, you're not running this busy, busy platform. What are you doing? And, um, and, and, and the reason I'm asking this is because as practitioners, we, are, we really focus on the practice. Really focusing on just money, just goods. Forgetting that, besides that, we also have another life <coughs> that we have to live. So when you're not doing, uh, running the farm, when you're not with your family, unafanya nani? Okay. <laughs> you also, Uma yeah. also has is that uh, you have a very big uh, motor cycle. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to avoid it. No one, what do you do to relax? Okay, so first of all, let me say this. Eh? Mm. Uh, I'm a strong believer in personal development. Yes. Okay? And I believe that um, even as one identifies themselves as, as a practitioner in whatever field. Mm. Uh, you should develop yourself within and without, uh, uh, outside that field. Uh, and I, I say this because you, you're not, you're a human being, you're not a stone. You have different facets of yourself. Uh, and that's why you wear different clothes on different days. <coughs> you have different hairstyles. You have different, because you're different. And your life cannot be focused on just this one thing yeah. uh, for you to thrive. Yeah. That's why you don't even eat the same food every mm. day. You have something, even in a day, you have different types of meals depending on the hour. You have your meal for breakfast is different from lunch and dinner. Mm. So having said that, uh, uh, I, I push myself to do uh, other things outside the legal profession to, to build myself and... Um, and also to make life enjoyable. Yeah, I, I believe in positivity and one must be positive and that can only come by enjoying the things that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would never criticize anyone from pursuing the things that give them happiness, as long as they are within the law and they don't, um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't yeah. destroy any relationships. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, any mm -hmm. of your critical relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You may enjoy drinking, but don't uh, overdo it yeah. and, and uh, yeah, yeah. deplete your, your family budget yeah. uh, on, uh, in, in pursuit of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So at an individual level, yeah. um, 
I believe that um, as a lawyer, I should develop uh, certain skills. And in that regard, what I do, I, I joined a club called Toastmasters, ah. which, which uh, allows people to develop their public speaking skills. Okay. And why did I join it? Because as a lawyer, people expect you to be, uh, to be a good speaker, to yeah. speak well, and, and not to be scared when you're speaking to members of the public or to a large crowd but it's very daunting and there's a skill to that mm. toastmasters teaches uh, people how to speak how to speak well how to speak coherently and how to address large groups of people without fearing so it's very helpful if if if, if one feels that they want to develop that as a skill uh, go for it and i did that and i even have spoken in one or two forums yeah. Uh, and people assume that as a lawyer, you are a good public speaker, but they forget that when you go to court, you are really speaking to one person, which is a judicial officer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you are not speaking to a group. The rest of the people are not even listening to you, so they are not your audience. Yeah. But when you are in a social gathering, people will pick on you because oh, Wakili is here. <laughs> he must speak, and then you start trembling. Yeah. Mm. So, so that hel that's helpful. And if if one finds uh, that they need to develop a particular skill within them, uh, then by all means they should pursue that. So I've pursued public speaking in that regard. Uh, I have also pursued music. Uh, that's why you see this guitar here. Yeah. And, and I must say that um, the reason, I, one of the things that really encouraged me about playing guitar yeah. was be being in a forum where there was a senior lawyer. Mm. and. Uh, and this was none other than Fred Ojembo. Yeah. And he picked up a guitar and he played mm -hmm. because he had learned how to play it when he was young. And I, I looked at him and I thought, you mean you can be a senior lawyer but still have a skill of this sort? So I was very encouraged by him. And, and because I liked, uh, I liked the guitar, I listened to jazz a lot. And, uh, I decided to learn how to play the guitar. And it's, it's very fulfilling because it's not easy. Uh, you, you have to practice a lot and you have to commit a lot of uh, things to memory, yeah. including sequences. What does, what comes after this and why is this like this? So it's very challenging and it's very fulfilling and, and I enjoy it. Uh, and like you, I, I, I do have a motorbike, <laughs> which I ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. I, I, again, this was uh, uh, started off uh, in, in a situation where somebody I was with uh, got onto a bike and before then I thought bikes were the preserve of delivery boys, delivery boys, or the sort of people I saw <laughs> in, on movies yeah. who, who were in big, big guns. Yeah. And this was a guy we were playing squash with and we walked out to the car park and he hopped onto a bike. Now, I, was, I was very curious. How, how does anybody who I know yes. ride a bike? Yeah. And uh, long story cut short, I ended up buying his bike. <laughs> <laughs> and he bought another one. <laughs> In fact, I was so excited about the prospects of riding yeah. that uh, uh, when the first out of town ride was organized by a group, I got into it and he was horrified because it was a small bike. It was a, a, a 175cc bike mm. and we were riding to Nyeri. And he, th he thought I was crazy. And actually, after that ride, I did realize that I you was crazy. crazy. <laughs> because <laughs> it wasn't a ride that a bike mm. like, of that CC could have done comfortably. I, it, it was, but it was good exposure to what riding um, entailed. Yeah. So that I do as a pastime. Uh, I do it with safety. And I encourage anybody who, who rides to be safe. Uh, have your gear, your helmet, your big jacket, knee, knee protectors and all that. Because you could be safe, but you don't know about the other person. So, yeah. so that's a passion I enjoy. It, it gives me a lot of joy uh, to, to be out on, mm -hmm. the, on the street yeah. uh, with the wind yeah. blowing and um, to be behind a helmet it uh, incognito. When you're on an open road without any, uh, any foreseeable obstacles, you can push it to a particular limit uh, and enjoy that space where <laughs>
you, but the you margin can, of yeah. error, yeah. the margin of error scares me. <laughs> that's the thrill. That's where that's the thrill. thrill. That's where the thrill comes uh, in. Okay. Uh, so, so I do, I do that occasionally. I, I do the biking. I do the, the guitar. I do the public speaking, uh, and I play squash, uh, uh, which, which, which is a very demanding game on the body, yeah. because you've got to move quickly, and you have to think, and you also have mm -hmm. to coordinate your yeah. body movements mm -hmm. so that uh, you hit the ball with accuracy. So by the time you get all those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. all those uh, boxes ticked and al aligned properly, yeah. uh, you, it also has a, a, um, a big effect on your temperament. So you must ensure that uh, when yeah. you're going to play, you're in a good frame of mind. Because mm. if you're distracted by this thing, mm. then you will not be able to focus on all those things. And, and really, that's what life is all about. Yeah. Um, learning to manage your temperament so that uh, whatever it is you apply yourself to, you give your best. If it's uh, a job you're doing for a client, you do it to your best because you, you know how to manage your temperament. So it's good to always place yourself in a situation where your temperament, uh, your te the, the management of your temperament is tested and you're, you're put in a place where you manage that temperament so that if, even if you've had a bad day, you're able to put it aside yeah. and focus on the task uh, at hand. As you say, today I want to play a good game. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. Whatever it is, whichever client has upset me, whoever it is, I want to put them on the back burner for a bit mm -hmm. and focus on being good at this. And of course, um, the focus on excellence. If, if it's a game that pushes you to constantly be excellent, uh, because you have to be accurate, you have to think about where to hit the ball, and how to hit it away from the opponent, yeah. and to do that with frequency. Yeah. So the 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 you know it's not it's it's not just like uh, being in the gym where yeah. you're just pushing machines. Yeah. And the, you you and then because you're being scored. So you 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 want to ensure that you have a good score yeah. uh, with every game. So again, the there's a, the need for excellence is hovering around constantly. Yeah. So that's why I enjoy the game. Mm. Yeah. So there's still some balance amidst the chaos. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you have to find you have your balance. balance. Yeah. And, and if you if you don't, yeah. then you end up being a very disagreeable person with your yeah. colleague because yeah. because you have no outlet yeah. for some yeah. of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 really at the end of the day, even though you're working for money, ultimately you can only wear one suit at a time. You can only drive one car at a time. You can only live in one house, sleep on one bed at a time. Um, everybody is working very hard to multiply all these things, yeah. which you can only use uh, once mm. at a time. Yeah. Even if I had six cars, I can only drive one of them at a time. So, mm. so what, what benefit is there in multiplying uh, a lot of these uh, material things at the expense of, uh, of, of human relations yes. yeah, and happiness? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We need an autograph. We need an autograph this shot. <laughs> Alright. So we would uh, really like to have your autograph here. Um, okay. Uh, maybe later on you're going to auction this for ridiculous amounts. <laughs> <laughs> and share it equally. Uh, and share it equally. <laughs> <laughs> or unequally. <laughs> Does it have to be a biro? I can get uh, yeah. a pen here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So Do you recognize any of the signatures? <laughs> I know this is Chachas. Thank you, Zibia. All right. To Meruka Inje, Kevin, could you pick a picture? A quick one, Wakili. <laughs>